First Peter, this would be 1, 3, eulogitos. If you're following along in your uh, Bibles, I'm sure it looks the same as I'm writing it. It's all Greek to me. And forgive if I leave out some uh, squigglies, diacritical marks or inflections. Now, the problem with dissecting a verse like this is it's a massive, massive verse. Uh, verse. Verse 3, even the translators saw this. Verse 3, I want to highlight how many commas and semicolons. Uh, for example, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, comma, to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you, comma. I'm only highlighting the commas that are at the end of the verses to show you that technically there should be no verse division. There was none when this letter was written. So look at how long this goes. Who are kept by the power of God through faith, unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. There was no period there, not in the original. Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptation. Uh, it continues, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than, than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Still not finished. Whom having not seen, can you imagine just <laughs> right? Whom having not seen ye love, in whom, though now ye see him not, yet believing ye rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Not finished. Now, I'm grateful that we have punctuations. Punctuations let us take a breath. Receiving the end of your faith, even the salvation of your souls. Guess what? It doesn't end there, really, because he's going to go on to elaborate. The salvation of your souls. Of which salvation? The prophets. So you can see how long this is. It's a large section. To prove my point, let's see if I can bring this up. We we'll begin here with eulogitos. That is where verse 3 begins, and I pointed this out to you. You see, this letter is protruding. Oops, I just cut off an E. I just erased the E, too. Oh, boy. Can you imagine if this was an original? All right, then. So... Okay. So, no problem. You can see how it protrudes out. It did at least protrude out into the column there. And this, this letter does not either. So you can see how far down until the next thought, even in the Sinaiticus, you can see this whole area here is quite in line with... So this begins a new thought, and you can see it exactly the way it is. The whole thought process is being laid out. So having pointed out that... This begins a new thought. The relevance of understanding what happens in translation with this word really sheds some light on why effectively the translators put in this blessed be. That's the way your King James reads. Blessed be the God. Let's put it in another color. Blessed be the God. And let's just do this. And Father, all right, just to complete a section. Now, oh, wow, they just, I said by, it's blessed be. I could be blessed by, I am blessed by, but we're talking about to be. All right, there we go. Okay. So, your King James and pretty much all of the translations are going to read blessed be, where the adjective is being used. For example, I gave you the example of 2 Corinthians 
in the opening of 2 Corinthians where this very same thing occurs, eulogitos, and in Ephesians, eulogitos. The problem is that when it came time to translate, there were some interesting issues. That's why you'll always see this being italicized even when you read the Psalms, which were obviously written in Hebrew. You're going to see blessed be, and then it goes on to say what is, whom is, or by what means. So let's first look at the Greek and tackle some core issues here. Eulogitos, we've said, is a compound put together of the prefix eu, which is good, and the root log, which becomes extremely important in understanding the roots or stems of words as we study the Bible. This ending here just tells you a little bit about how it functions. Eulogitos is an adjective. And an adjective describes something. It is a descriptive. It helps, like we say, the red car. Red is the adjective describing the car. So here, what the Greek does is it lets us be extremely precise. This is an adjective. It's in the nominative case, masculine and singular. It will agree, this adjective agrees in case with theos and God and Father. They agree in case. These are nouns that are in the nominative case. They are, thank goodness, masculine and singular, both of these. So this adjective, eulogitos, is telling us something about God and Father. And these two nouns are separated by this word. We're saying, we're calling it a conjunction. It is that. And, but in the Greek, you have different levels of conjunctions. This is about the most grammar I'm going to do, so stay with me. In the Greek, you have coordinating, coordinating conjunctions. You've got subordinating conjunctions, and you've got hyperconjunctions. When it's coordinating, it means that this and makes this God and Father equal. This is a coordinating conjunction, which means that the adjective that is describing something about God and about the Father are even. They're evenly being described by this being a coordinating conjunction. So all of this tells me something back about this word, eulogitos. We say, for example, people would translate this word praise. The NIV did that, by the way. And let me tell you why, in some sense, it is correct, and in some sense, it's absolutely incorrect. The contemporary parallel New Testament, uh, eight translations of this very verse The bulk of the translators elected or chose to use blessed. Um, I think only two translations went elsewhere. The contemporary English version says, Praise God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is so good, and by raising Jesus from death, he has given us a new life, etc., etc., carrying on the verse. The NIV says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and so on. The bulk of these other translations have stayed with blessed or blessed. Now, the problem is, in our English language, the word blessed, blessed is a, can be a past participle. Uh, past, past participle, which if you were doing grammar, if you were just taking English grammar, you would understand the difference between the root bless. Bless can be to bless, to be blessed, to have been blessed, but a past participle obviously has some indicator putting this act ed on the end that it is what it's called in the English, past participle. 
The Greek is using an adjective. Why I took stock of this is because it can function like Peter is saying, like the NIV has, praise God, praise, the fa- praise God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he's saying something deeper than that in using this word eulogatos. You see, the Greek word has a word for praise. It's not used very often, but it looks like this. Aneo. That's not Greek, that's English. For praise. And so Peter could have used the word praise God, but what he was saying was speaking good words or good eulogizing or good eulogitos, but he's also describing something about God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now this whole, what I've just done, at first blush you might say, well, what does that do for me now? How does that help me understand the scriptures now? Let me tell you, by putting this out and describing that it's an adjective, telling us something about God and the Father, and Peter could be expressing good words, telling us about God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, in eulogizing, or as the the NIV is using the word praise. This becomes helpful when we get into the Psalms. If you've read the Psalms, don't turn there. Don't turn to the Psalms, because I'm not going to stay there. Some of you will be disobedient and do it anyways, but I'm telling you not to. All right. If you read in the Psalms, for example, Psalm 28 and verse 6, Blessed be the Lord, because he hath heard the voice of my supplications. This pattern is peppered throughout the scripture in the Psalms. You might say, how does this attach to this? The Septuagint, we know that uh, Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament done between 2 and 300 B.C., in translating some of the Psalms, such as Psalm 28 and verse 6, blessed be, used the word eulogitos, making it an adjective as the psalmist poured out some descriptive, great God. See, this is what happens. If, if I stayed log jammed in my mind over the word blessed, I guarantee you many other people have because it's used in such a way that it's so hard to understand. There are places in the Bible, as I described last week, for the most part, we encounter God who is blessing, he is blessing man. There are passages in the Bible where man is speaking good words to God. The translators never even change the term. So they used the same word and said, blessed as well. Now, we both, as a body, understand, every person in this room understands, the inferior does not bless the superior. The superior blesses the inferior. So to better understand the use of this word and how it functions, I did this handout. It gives you a rainbow of not just the surface, look it up in Strong's, but it gives you some examples. I'm so tired of people using words and they don't really know what they're saying. I was with a very sweet lady yesterday. She's very kind, but she said, will you, will you go and bless this person? And I thought, wait a minute, let's be clear about something. The way I understand, I can speak good words to somebody the way I'm understanding the scripture. There are cases in the scripture where man, a man, blessed another man. I mentioned that last week, where we see Pharaoh being blessed. And by the way, the man of God was superior to the king of Egypt, the Pharaoh. But in terms of understanding, they were just both men. But in in the now, you know, people go and make pilgrimages to the Catholic Church to receive a blessing from the Pope. How many have seen 
signs that say, come and bring your animals so that they can be blessed. My dog is already blessed, thank you very much. <laughs> and my dog blesses me daily. <laughs> Some of you will get that later. I am on page two. We already covered the, the uh, dictionary and the etymological basis for the word blessed, which I think makes it abundantly clear that people tend to use, mistakenly use the word bless with the connotations that it may be related to bliss for which it is absolutely not related. If you go to the base meaning of the original sense to mark with blood, you know, bless your heart. <laughs> Sounds good, doesn't it? All right, so now you're going to see why we're, we're doing this and what really what is important about studying the word and making sure we understand the basis for the things we say. Page two of this handout. Um, I put at the top, bless and blessed in the New Testament. And we're looking at, specifically today, the eulogy words, the makarios words. I've used it first comparatively in the example on the upper part of this handout to show you the difference between Matthew 5, 8, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And here in Matthew 5, 8, my reference, it is the other blessed word, makarios, all right, which is denoting something different than the eulogy words. And of course, 1 Peter 1, 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Here, the word blessed is eulogitos. Now I want you to see what is so remarkable about this word. You can see that its use, as I've broken it down, 40 times as a verb, 40 times as a verb, 8 times as an adjective, and 16 times as a noun. The remarkable thing is you get grammar rules put in your brain real quick by seeing that these eight times eulogitos as an adjective, the eulogy word as an adjective, are only used of God, a descriptive of God toward God and not of man. That begins to let us explore this word. You know, we break down verbs, and I've given you some examples. For example... In this handout, you'll see uh, number one, halfway through the middle of the page, the use of the verb falls under a few of these. Bless those that curse you. The activity of speaking good words, and it's still going to be translated the same, of speaking good words to those who curse you. You know, it's difficult for me as a believer to understand, this is a difficulty for me, why people do not want to take the time to study the word and get it in their head. You are not going to be conformed to the image and likeness of Christ by doing it yourself. The only thing that has the power to change you and to change me is God through his word by the Holy Spirit. And when that understanding comes, there, there'd be many more people studying God's word to try and find out how I can be changed because on my own I cannot be changed and I desire to be changed. Then we begin walking in the word and we read an instruction, a verbal instruction from the Lord himself. Bless those that curse you. And people will say, well, are you trying to tell me what to do when people are speaking evil to me? No, Jesus is. Now, I can tell you, and I'm, I have no shame to say it, I haven't arrived there to bless people uh, as they curse me. I haven't arrived there. I haven't arrived there yet. But I am telling you some of these verbal activities given to us by the Word himself as instruction. You know, when people say, I want to be conformed, and the beginning of conforming is, is the living and reading the word. And then you say, oh, well, I, I can't do that. Well, I'm, 
I'm just, right now I'm at the stage at this particular place where Jesus said, bless those that curse you. I'm in the place of just praying to attain to the mindset because my mind is still in a carnal mode that says, when somebody comes along and waves at me with that special finger, you know what I want to do back. (laughs) At least I'm honest about it. So the verb is used, you're going to remember this now. The verb is used, bless, curse. And I would say just as a small sidebar, you're going to find as you travel through the Old Testament and examine the word bless, you're always going to find that on the other side of blessing is curse and cursing and cursed of God. In the Semitic frame of reference, it was so important to live under the wings of, under the promise of, under the covenant of blessing because there wasn't an option. You were either living under that frame of work or you were cursed. There wasn't anything in between. We have changed the meaning of blessing coming from God and we've certainly changed the meaning of blessing when it comes to the instructions from Jesus' lips to us. So this is why I feel this is extremely important. There's another verbal activity where Jesus is blessing the food. And again, there is the verbal activity, the blessing of the cup in communion. There is the blessing of the children of the womb of Mary as Christ was dedicated in the temple. So it says of him that he was blessed by the priest in the temple when he was a child. So we have the verbal activity 40 times. Eight times, as I said, as an adjective, now as a noun, and I gave you some examples here. For example, in 2 Corinthians 9, 5, it it is talked about as a part of giving. And extremely important that we understand, whereas in English, the translators, for example, when it was a noun, used the word bounty, they were speaking of giving, using the same eulogy root words, eulogia. Now, I tried to kind of break this down and make it at least simple enough to see, but one must go back to study at least, I'd say, uh, I wrote them all down here, Here they are. As we read the roots, the stems, the base, in any language, this word log has a great importance to us. You cannot not define this word, see its attachment, and understand that at the center of this, we go back to two words, two roots, Leg and log for the Greek. Now, the Greek language is highly inflected, which means as something becomes an activity. Highly inflected means everything may be contained within one word. In the English, we may have to say, I will be running shortly. In the Greek, we could probably say it with one word and an adjective, period. It's it's highly inflected, so it's self-contained. These roots become the basis of words that develop and flow, such as eulogitos. Now, somewhere before the flood, I was talking to you about testimony and witness. And I said, all of the people that make this mistake of saying, when Paul gives his testimony, no. When Paul gives his apologia at the root of his apologia is the word log. You can see it, correct? All right. And it is this word log stems from what we are translating as word, as capital W, word, referring to the Lord himself, and many words that stream from this. And leg, leg, the root of leg, you have... To, to choose or pick 
with words, with speaking, with voice, and log from say, speak, speech. They both flow together and words will progress. So, for example, I wrote here apologia. There are other words like logism, logizomai or di dialogizomai. The words that all contain these log roots say something about the words they are conveying. So it's not haphazard when we begin to look at this word that at the center of this sits the log root. And log, we have, I've just identified with a capital W as the word proper, the word referring to Jesus Christ. So it becomes important to really go back and look closely at how these words and their roots are paved through the whole of Scripture. You see, God did not bless at the beginning. I referred to Adam and Eve and the creation last week. God did not bless at the beginning by any other means than by speaking. In fact, I wrote for myself as a note to share with you at some point the translation, the Septuagint of the scripture that I referenced with you last week regarding God blessing uh, Adam and Eve. In the Septuagint reads, Kai ilogesin atus hotheos legon. He blessed them saying, Legon, leg. He blessed them with a eulogy through the leg. Lego, conjugate for the Greek grammarians here. Lego, all right? I, I say or I speak. Lego, and you could conjugate the whole thing. This O being the person and leg being the root. This becomes important to understand where we get the idea of blessings immediately as tangible become erroneous. Now, blessings will become, as we progress through the scripture, there will be blessings that will be tangible. Those will be revealed to us through the Hebrew as nouns and with a certain different spelling, but the same root of the Baruch words, and through the Greek, we're able to understand there has been a caricature of using this word bless to define other things other than the beginning of which blessing, which Ephesians 1.3 declares when it says, bless, he blessed us with all spiritual blessings with words. He blessed us through words. We speak of John and we say, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word, the Word, which became the living Word incarnate, which became this Word that now I've just said should become engrafted in us as a, an effect of reading and studying and staying in the Word, which becomes the preached Word, which I declare to you today, is at the essence of of this word right here. Now let's hang all of that on 1 Peter 1 3. And let's just get a little glimpse of why this becomes important. Think about it. He is an ex making an expression. Peter is making an expression in saying, Blessed. Be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's do one thing in your Bible, please. The B is put in so you can, so you and I as readers can understand the B would be a participle or would be a helps to understand that it is not blessed, blessed to someone else, but referring to God. It's showing us this dimension. You can cross that out. And there is a the it makes it more difficult to read. 
without the the, the definite article, but if we just had eulogitos ho theos, and we are keeping the the in, the b is removed, and we are making this eulogitos, attaching it directly to God and Father. It would be analogous to, to using some other adjective to, to say a word to God descriptive on the one side and speaking good words, praising on the other, combined in one. We'll have fun when I have to explain what a participle is. Until then, <gasps> hold your breath. All right. We've already scratched out the B. So blessed, the God doesn't flow so good anymore. But it's going to make you stop and look at that word. Now, I guarantee you, if, if this lesson does nothing else today, it will make you go back and reread Psalms where the word blessed, baruch, barach, berek, occur, and you're going to look at them in a new light. So, blessed the God, and I would just say bless God for flow of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. So the first thing we can tell that Peter is doing as he is writing and explaining why, why God is eulogitos. First thing he tells us, living, living hope. That's the first thing he tells us. The second thing he tells us is about inheritance, imperishable, incorruptible, that fadeth not away. And the third thing he's going to tell us is about a salvation. He says, about to be revealed. Three things he tells us. Three things are being, in this whole big, <gasps> three things are being said. According to his abundant mercy, that is, Understanding that God did not need to do what he did, but he did it in his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again. I know somebody's going to say, we explain that? Absolutely. Just not now. No, I'll tell you right now so you can color in the, the picture for yourself. See, this is why words, you may say, you're stressing me out with these words and grammar, and I just, just tell it to me. This is the problem. This is where our language breaks down. Watch this. Hath begotten us again. That word is actually one word in the Greek. Four words in English, one word in the Greek. Telling us about what Jesus discussed with Nicodemus. The same word is being used in John 3 when Nicodemus comes to, John, to, to Jesus and says, How can a man be born again? Same words being used. So four English words, one Greek word. Anagonesis, to be born from above. And when you really begin to see why Peter is calling God eulogatos, because of his abundant mercy, according to his abundant mercy, hath begotten us again. We are born again unto a lively hope. Now, I know this, and you know this, without hope in a resurrected life, without hope in eternity, we're, we're just wasting our time. This is the most miserable existence if this is all there is. He says, unto a lively hope, and the, by the means of, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, seeing Jesus Christ as first. Corinthians 15 declares, as he is risen, so shall we to an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, that cannot be loosed, that cannot be destroyed, that cannot be stolen, that cannot be walked on, reserved in heaven for you. This should be the first message for Christians everywhere. Reserved in heaven for you. Not reserved in the now. Reserved in heaven for you. You ever hear somebody say, will, will you save me a spot? You're going somewhere. You're going to the theater, the movie. Save me a spot. Save me a spot in line. 
We have no trouble thinking of that and saying, sure. And you just stand there and take the room of two people. Well, apply that scripturally. Reserve for you in heaven. Somebody's already reserved a place for you in heaven. And people fuss so much about earthly things. When I compare whatever I could amass, how much or how little in the earthly realm to what is reserved in heaven for me, I'd be a fool to toil and try and wrestle with the things down here as much as people do and as much as they profess, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, those multicolored, multidimensional temptations, that the trial of your faith, So I want you to notice something. He starts off, let's call this a a doxology. So I have one one term to use. He starts off with a doxology. He says something that is God-word, a descriptive of God, thanking God for the recognition of what he has done according to his abundant mercy. I hope lights will come on to this because a couple of weeks ago I was stuck on the people crying out, Son of David, have mercy on us. These were all sick people, and as he passed by, he had mercy on them, and he healed them at their cry, in their need. His mercy dispensed to an undeserving person. Nevertheless, he did. So think about this. He begins with a doxology, something that is speaking and talking about God Great God, magnificent God, some descriptive of God, speaking good words, eulogizing him, according to his abundant mercy. Say, in the dimension of God's abundant mercy, begetting us again, being born again, to a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and, so, one, a living hope, two, The next thing, an inheritance. Not just I too and you too will raise again, but something reserved for me in heaven, an inheritance. Incorruptible, undefiled. Think about all that is being lined up. And then he goes immediately into saying, hey, what you're going through right now, your problems you're going through right now, this is, I'm I'm in, at the end of verse 6, the problems you're in right now, the things you're going through right now, they're just for a time. And by the way, the full reason, they'll produce more faith in your life, that what you think you have at the level you have, it might be even brought forth even more, the trying of your faith, that it might be found under praise, honor, and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, just that in and of itself got my attention as I went back to the Psalms you're going to see a pattern that is woven through the Psalms as the psalmist cries out about some issue or some problem he is facing. The response there afterwards will be, blessed be the Lord, and now it'll tell you what he's thanking God for. Let me give you an example. I want you to keep First Peter at the back of your mind. I just gave you the doxology. He starts off with, speaking good words in a descriptive towards God regarding all that God has done in his abundant mercy. Didn't need to do it, but did it anyway. And then goes on to talk about how even if you're in manifold temptation, the trial of your faith, in essence, you will come through this. It's just for a time. Now watch what happens in the patterns of the Psalms that I've at least highlighted. Uh, Now you may turn to Psalm 28. You'll see a pattern. This is not a unique uh, situation. Psalm 28. Now, I'm going to look at verse 6, but I'm going to read through the psalm as a response to a calling forth to God. Psalm 28. Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock. Be not silent to me, lest... If thou be silent to me, I became like them that go down into the pit. 
Hear my voice of supplications when I cry unto thee, when I lift up my hands toward thy holy oracle. Draw me not away with the wicked and with the workers of iniquity, which speak peace to their neighbors, but mischief is in their hearts. Give them according to their deeds. The psalmist is saying, repay them according to their deeds, according to the wickedness of their endeavors. Give them after the work of their hands. Render to them their desert, what they deserve to get. Because they regard not the works of the Lord, nor the operation of his hands, he shall destroy them and not build them up. Now listen to the psalmist. Blessed be. You see, be is italicized here too. This goes straight through the scriptures. Blessed be the Lord, because he hath heard the voice of my supplications. Now, from verses 1 through 5, it is the call to God. Hear my supplication. Hear my prayer. God, help me. Echo into the New Testament. Have mercy, O son of David. Have mercy on us. He was filled with compassion, and he healed these people. The psalmist crying out to God, and then suddenly a gear is shifted to blessing Baruch. Bless the Lord. I want you to focus on one word that's right in there that says it all. Because. Bless the Lord because he hath heard the voice of my supplications. You see, you're going to find this pattern throughout the Psalms. Um, Let me give you another example so you don't think this is a one-hit wonder here because I like to back up things with Scripture. Um, Psalm 31 and verse 21. Just a page or two over there. A little bit different pattern of Psalm But you've got the same thing going on, a cry of petition, a cry of supplication, help me, assist me, be my rock, my fortress. In verse 21, read, blessed, you see, be italicized again. Bless the Lord, for he has showed me his marvelous kindness in a strong city. If you read through this whole psalm, you'll see the pattern which I am speaking, which is, for every time that someone cries out and says, hear my call, hear my petition, here is my supplication. Blessed God, bless the Lord, for he hath heard, for he was. And they go on to describe using the Hebrew pattern, ki, because. Then there is this eulogizing, speaking forth to God. Now, notice that the psalmist, and through the Psalter, you're going to find that this is a pattern in response to God responding to a cry or a need. If you go back into 1 Peter with me, you'll find the pattern is there. It's just, it's in a new dimension. It's in a new presentation. And rather than putting the petition and the problem first, Peter, voice of experience, talks about God first, he eulogizes God. It reminds me a little bit of David. Remember when David was younger? It took him a long time to get to the faith of saying, I will trust, I trust. It took him a long time, but as he got older and faith came and he was stronger and he had learned to lean on God, it took him a lot less time to lament and talk about his disasters and he came a lot quicker to, I will trust in the Lord. Remember that through the Psalms? But we have the same principles being applied in 1 Peter, except Peter is not spending any time at the beginning lamenting. He goes right into a eulogizing, adjectival force regarding God, a descriptive to talk about this good, great God, that Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that through his abundant Elios, through his abundant mercy, through his polo, polu, elios, through his, the, the, the polu is great as a small word compared to polus. It's, it's magnificent mercy has done these things. Begotten us again, born again, 
to a lively hope, inheritance, and a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. Goes straight way into that and then tells the people, remember, this is a letter of encouragement for people who are persecuted and struggling in this time that Peter's writing. And I think that's probably why I feel so connected to this book, because I do understand, as Christians who just try, you just try to stay your ground each day and keep the faith and not be knocked over, not just by life circumstances, but what I call the rest of the Christian universe that never seems to have any problems and you're just a freak because you have them, or you look exactly like the people in the Bible because you too are being sifted and shaken like God did to these saints that are recorded in his book. So it makes me go back and say there's got to be something more that Peter was conveying. And most certainly, as I investigated this, it was the beginning of understanding this pattern, this pattern of the translators using blessed be. Go straight through the Bible. You'll find immediately after the book of Genesis, there may be a few references of the blessed be pattern, but after the book of Genesis, most of the references are going to be Godward. And unfortunately, it's the way things go. I'll have to explain, and I think I'll do it on festival if you want to know what a participle is. It, it's, once, it, once you have it explained to you, you'll go, oh, I get it. You know, I've heard people say, well, a participle, why do you need to know what a participle is? Because all of the occurrences of blessed be in the Old Testament all occur the same way in this formula. They all occur in the Hebrew call stem in what is called the pass, passive participle. And to understand that, once you understand it, you understand the psalmist. All, every psalmist, every writer who used the blessed be formula understood they were saying an, ad, an adjectival force towards God in a description but in a verbal action where God was the object in a passive way. Can you repeat that again? <laughs> Once that becomes clear, everything takes on a new dimension. You see, translators have fought over this for a long time. Until you begin to open up your horizons and you want to learn and you start walking through doors that scholars have debated and wrestled with for so long, volumes of these things have been penned where people have fought one of the most brilliant men, I put him in my, um, in my bibliography. Uh, he would be number, number nine. Gesenius, as a brilliant uh, grammarian, super amazing grammarian. And he describes one of the uses of blessed be and says, in one particular use, he says, blessed be is really a Hebrew form of a genitive meaning. So basically, blessed of the Lord. I went through this with a fine-tooth comb, and I said, wait a minute. They can't all be blessed of the Lord. Maybe that's what they're meaning, but they can't all be that. Sure enough, if you start looking, and you know Hebrew grammar, you recognize these all have shades of meaning because Hebrew is ambiguous. They all have shades of meaning, and their verbal force define the actor and the action. So while English people, such as myself, are quite glib to say, bless, bless the Lord, what does it mean? Who is blessing who? Ah. At least initially, from this passage in 1 Peter, and from all of the use of the Septuagint and their translation, which is the Hebrew translated into Greek, uh, between two and 300, as I said, B.C., you're going to find that in reference to God, we have this good word descriptive of God and the Father being taken right through the scriptures. Now, amazingly enough, tracing through all of these low roots, you find it's as if God is saying, is, any, is anybody listening? Are you in there? He has blessed us ultimately through his word. And to, to look past this and say, well, what's the big deal? You fail to see and I will fail to see that 
He has blessed us through his word, which said word became the living word, the incarnate word, the spoken word, the preached word, the word we latch on to and we say claim a promise in that word, in the beginning when he spoke the word. And the word that he spoke brought everything into existence that was not. We read those things and we, we come to some conclusion that this concept must somehow first serve me. At the root of this, you're going to find something. This is what I, my mind has gotten tired over. People using the scripture to serve themselves first, as if the Bible is a self-service mechanism for you to... You should reach in and grab the goodies and take everything that's in here and say, this is mine, every word of it, every last syllable. But when we rightly understand the beginning of the blessings of God, looking from Peter's perspective. He is describing something that is not self-obtained, not selfish, not self-driven. He's looking Godward and giving a word, a good word spoken, a descriptive, magnifying the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ for his abundant mercy. If I put a period there, and we even didn't define what the abundant mercy contains... I would have said enough. In highlighting this, you're going to see why, at least for me, the descriptive. Can you imagine if we only had one frame of reference to work on, the English word blessed, and nothing behind it, nothing to understand that, for example, as an adjective or as a past participle versus as the Greek has it plain and simple, every single occurrence as an adjective speaking about God, toward God, not aimed at man. That becomes extremely clear when we compare this word blessed, eulogy, to the words makarios, blessed. You'll find, let's go back to the handout before I'm done. We at least cover that. On page 3, See how many times on page top of page three, Makarios is used fifty times as an adjective versus only twice as a verb. Fifty times as an adjective. That's why I said they're not synonyms. And unfortunately for us, we have one word in the English which is being used to describe two different words in the Greek. The adjective makarios in the Greek dimension will color in a whole other side of us, mankind, as an adjective, describing us, our state of being, how we are as we go. This is why eight times adjective eulogitos, only of God, 50 times adjective makarios, mostly and predominantly of mankind. When you begin to see the clarity of words and how they function, you go back to the text and you think to yourself, Peter was not saying and describing himself. When we begin to pull apart the words, we'll see where we can take words to ourselves and say, as Jesus spoke in the Beatitudes, blessed is this person, that thus and so, walking in this condition by faith, being filled by these circumstances, that I speak, the word spoke to us, as man is the recipient. Versus right here where Peter goes into this great praise, great doxology, God word, saying a word to those saints and encouraging them and saying, listen, rather than starting off by saying, hey, I know your troubles and I know that you're persecuted and your trials are incredible, he says, first of all, doxology to God, who through his abundant mercy did these things. Now, let's talk about your problems. And by the way, I guarantee you, as he culminates, the, 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 the terminus of his whole speech is, you are going to make it through. God's given you the equipment. He's given you the hope. He's given you the first goer, the resurrected Christ. Now, here's the faith. Walk in it. Get up and walk. That's going to be the whole picture of the first epistle of Peter. And these Words are going to help us 
Take our eyes off of our circumstances and look Godward, letting us praise and worship him and sing the sounds of thanks to his ears. That should be some lesson somewhere that we need to put into practice rather than lamenting where we are and, oh, God, you don't know how terrible it's been. How about the first thing? Thank you, God, for bringing me through. Thank you for seeing me through the tough times when there wasn't a way, you made a way. This is the type of speak that sojourners of the faith, as we are, should begin as a faith practice. Sometimes it's easy to drop your guard and you get caught up in the moment and you begin to look in the inside rather than looking Godward and speaking to him and saying, thank you, like Peter, bless God because of his abundant mercy by the grace of God. I'm standing in front of you. You're sitting here and together as the church, we're opening up his word, this bread of life and sharing it together. That's a a good reason to give thanks. That's my message. I'm Pastor Melissa Scott, pastor of Faith Center, Glendale, California. I teach every Sunday morning at 11 a.m. If you'd like to attend services with us, simply call the 800 number, that is 800-338-3030, to join us. If you'd like to watch Listen and learn 24 hours a day. Simply log on to our website at www.pastormelissascott.com.